All right, we'll go ahead and get started as I know a few more folks um, will be joining us um, as we open up this first in a series of webinars hosted by Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action. My name is John Bagwell. Um, I, you all have received the email notifications from me and I should note early on here, I hope all of you can hear, hear me clearly and um, the platform is working. This is a new um, platform for us uh, as we're seeking to hold this series of webinars and so please forgive us if we have any technical difficulties or um, or, or, or uh, slow to figure anything out but I think that we've uh, we've all had it tested and uh, feel good about this um, all of you should know that participants are muted upon entry and we will take um, questions throughout the presentation um, on the bottom of your screen in the webinar window, you should see a Q&A box. Um, there you can submit questions as you think of them throughout the presentation. Um, uh, I'm going to be introducing shortly uh, Dr. Samantha Dute, who's the chair and co-founder of uh, Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action, who's going to introduce our main speaker today. And we'll have a, a 20 to 30 minute presentation on uh, allergies and how climate change is affecting seasonal allergies in Virginia, and then um, answer some of those questions that came in. If you have um, any technical issues or questions or follow-up questions that we don't get to in this, please feel free to uh, reach out to us. You can email info at virginiaclinicians.org anytime, and we're always happy to provide resources or follow-up links um, to things that might be referenced throughout. Uh, but with that, we'll go ahead and get started, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Adu. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action today for the inaugural, inaugural presentation of our 2020 webinar series, Health in Virginia's Changing Climate. Now, as we all know, this is a very challenging time for all of us, and it's hard to focus on issues other than the COVID-19 crisis that we're all facing. But we also know that humanity is facing another crisis, the climate crisis, which appears to be moving more slowly on a human time scale, but which is really progressing at lightning speed on a geological time scale. So it remains vital that even during these very difficult times, we continue in our efforts to understand climate change. And for us as clinicians, that includes understanding how changing climate conditions affect the health of our patients and our communities and what we can do to protect our families today and our future tomorrow. So with that, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for today's webinar, which will focus on climate change effects on seasonal allergies. Our speaker is Dr. Christine James, an allergy immunologist who completed her training at the University of Cincinnati, Cincinnati Children's Hospital, before joining the Institute for Asthma and Allergy in Maryland. Dr. James will cover how climate change is affecting our, our allergy seasons and how health professionals can help connect the dots between the health of our planet and the health of our patients. So with that, I'll hand it to Dr. James. Thank you so much, Sam, for that introduction. Um, so um, thank you guys for, for joining in today. Um, so um, as Sam mentioned, we're actually gonna be talking about allergic disease in a changing climate. So um, the topics to be discussed today include what is climate change? What is the impact of climate change on allergic disease? And how can you help in the fight against climate change? So what is climate change? So climate change is our change in the typical or average weather of a region. Um, examples of that include uh, typical precipitation patterns, um, changes in the average temperatures for a given month or year. Um, and is this different from global warming? Yes, it is. So what is global warming exactly? So global warming actually refers to the recent and ongoing rise in your global average temperature near the Earth's surface, surface excuse me. Um, and while global warming contributes to climate change, it's not the only factor. And just to give an example, um, the pictures below are actually of the Florida Everglades. So 
on the left side, you have the Florida Everglades uh, before they've been having their hurricane seasons and then what's happened to them afterwards. And, and you can see the, the big change there. So how does climate change happen? So the greenhouse effect is the key underlying factor for climate change. And interestingly enough, it's actually been described since the 1800s. So how does it work? Well, when sunlight reaches the reaches the earth, you have some energy that gets reflected back into space and then some of it that's absorbed and re-radiated as heat. Um, and most of this heat gets absorbed by greenhouse gases, which include water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and others. Um, these greenhouse gases retain that heat that's reflected off of the earth and they're very much essential for life on the planet. But unfortunately, human burning of fossil fuels like coal, oil, gas are actually changing our natural greenhouse uh, because they're causing the release of greenhouse gases that were previously stored within our earth. Um, and when you combine this combustion with major deforestation, such as what's happening um, in the Amazon, this has led to increased concentrations of atmospheric carbon dioxide, um, which has, again, led to more trapping of heat and warming of the planet. And what you see here, um, so carbon dioxide is our most important greenhouse gas. And for so many years, um, the CO2 levels were maintained within a range never going above 320 parts per million, which is what you see with this line right here. Um, and before the industrial revolution, um, you know, again, these these levels were relatively low, but now um, this level has actually reached 413 parts per million. So as you can see here, just this dramatic increase in that rise. And so how has the climate um, changed? So when you look at our global surface temperature, actually in 2019, um, this was actually the second warmest since modern record keeping since 1880. Um, and that was uh, 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than our 1951 to 1980 average. And what's even more concerning is the fact that two thirds of this warming um, has occurred since 1975, which is relatively recently um, at a rate of 0.15 to 0.2 degrees Celsius per decade. So why does this all even matter? So for someone like me, um, you know, we see the pictures of um, these, um, these children here. And so a lot of us are faced with patients who are coming into our office and they're saying, I am sneezing uncontrollably. My postnasal drip is out of control. Um, you know, looking at children, we can see evidence of allergic shiners. And then of course that nasal crease that comes from children constantly wiping their nose. Um, and, you know, allergies have been very much affected by climate change. And so what this um, chart actually looks at, um, this was actually from a review um, in 2006, which looked at a lot of the different changes um, from climate change and how um, they've affected health. And I put a box around um, aeroallergen production. Um, so, you know, one thing obviously is that you see um, with you have a, an increase in your symptoms related to your um, allergic disorders uh, like allergic rhinitis and asthma. So that's a, you know, an adverse effect. Um, but interestingly enough, what they've also seen um, with, certain, with certain areas is that uh, because of climate change and, and how weather patterns and things like that have changed, um, certain areas have actually seen uh, reduced exposure to aeroallergens. Um, unfortunately, that is not the case for us here um, in this part of the country. So the connection between climate change and aerobiology. So you actually have two important factors. First, you have the differential spatial increases in global surface temperature. So these increases are a function of the relative proportion of the different greenhouse gases. So to give you a reference point for what I'm talking about here, um, at the equator where the weather is very warm and humid, 
water vapor is the dominant greenhouse gas and increasing carbon dioxide concentrations actually have smaller relative effects um, than adding CO2 to regions that have less desert and water vapor. So this differential increase in surface temperatures is likely a dr driver of extreme weather events. And these extreme weather events actually have um, a significant um, global impact on plant life cycles. And then the second factor, um, almost all aspects of plant biology are likely to be affected by increasing CO2 concentrations. Um, this makes sense because carbon dioxide is your sole supplier of carbon for photosynthesis and growth. So there's actually um, a group in Europe that looks at, um, you know, phenology, the study of plant and animal life and how that's changing in terms of the climate. So one of the first points they found was that um, spring events have advanced by six days. Autumn events have actually been delayed by at least five days when you compare them to the 1960s. The length of the growing season in Europe has increased by 10 to 11 days during the last 30 years. And the trends in the pollen amount over the later decades of the 1900s have increased according to local rises in temperature. And then just getting back to, you know, carbon dioxide, I mean, just some, you know, middle school, high school biology, um, as we remember, you know, carbon dioxide is used by plants for photosynthesis, it increases their growth. Um, and then it also causes plants to devote more energy to reproduction through higher production of pollen. So we have obviously three main plants that we actually, you know, think about um, in terms of allergies that are going to be affected by all of this. So first you have trees. And what we're finding is that you actually have earlier initiation of flowering for oak and birch. In Switzerland and Denmark, they actually found increased hazel and birch counts. And then olive trees are actually, um, they're, they're pollinating much earlier, one to three weeks ahead of time. And they found these uh, changes with certain weeds like mugwort, nettle, as well as some grasses. And then of course, um, ragweed is a big one. Um, and the other thing that I want you guys to think about is, you know, when these different types of plants um, are, you know, are coming out. Um, so trees, we generally think of them as coming out um, early spring. So, you know, right about now. Um, and then grass tends to be late spring and early summer. And ragweed tends to be late summer and early fall. So grass pollen production um, has been seen uh, to increase in response to elevated carbon dioxide levels. And this specific um, uh, picture comes from um, a study looking at Timothy grass, um, which is a major cause of summer allergies. So what we're looking at here is the fact that um, grass that's been grown at 800 parts per million um, of CO2 produced three times more pollen than plants grown at 400 parts per million. Um, and one thing that I just want you guys to note is that um, the, the differences in terms of the percentage increases actually based on in this study, um, they were also looking at the effect of ozone, which is actually a repressor of pollen and allergen production in Timothy grass. And what they're pointing out is that despite the fact that you do have um, some decrease in the pollen production, that ozone uh, doesn't make enough of a difference. You can see that CO2 is still such a big driver of that. So then um, in looking at ragweed, so um, there was a study actually done in the US by Ziska that, that found that the ragweed season duration has been increasing as a function of latitude. Um, and these effects were actually associated with delays in the first frost of the fall season, as well as lengthening of the frost free period. And the way that they actually did this is pretty interesting. So um, the National Allergy Bureau um, 
has eight locations um, where they had at least 15 years of ragweed data ranging from a latitude of about 30 degrees north to 47 degrees north. And there was a software program by Texas A&M that was um, used to actually locate your nearest US weather stations to obtain those daily temperatures um, that corresponded to the pollen record, um, as well as the pollen counting stations along these latitudes. And so the seasonal changes in the temperature were plotted for each location and compared with the duration of the ragweed pollen season. And so what they actually found is that that length of the ragweed pollen season um, increased by at least 13 to 27 days um, at latitudes above 44 degrees since 1995. Um, they did a similar study as well um, in Leicester, England, and basically they found that their ragweed season um, was peaking um, in early September. And this was actually thought to be not only due to your local ragweed plant releasing pollen, but um, also the long distance transport from mainland Europe by wind. And then, of course, this is um, some more research that was done where they were um, looking at different studies. Um, and basically what this graph uh, looks at is, you know, you have three studies that actually show that percent rise in ragweed pollen production that's on your X axis um, for plants grown at different carbon dioxide concentrations. And that's your Y axis right here. And so obviously you can just see that you know, there's significant growth of ragweed with increased CO2 levels. And then of course, trees, which are, they are our biggest issue right now. So um, there was actually a study done that looked at oak trees grown in different carbon dioxide environments. And so this image right here, what this shows is actually an outdoor carbon enrichment facility in which the trees were grown at 400, 560, and 720 parts per million um, carbon dioxide. And what, um, this, uh, what this chart shows is basically that when you look at trees that are grown at 720 parts per million, they produce um, almost 1300% more pollen than the trees grown at 400 parts per million. So, obviously a, a big difference there. And, you know, in within um, our own practices, we're, we're actually looking at these pollen counts. And this data actually comes from um, Allergy Partners of Richmond. So they've been monitoring their pollen counts on, the, on their roof since, since the 1980s. Um, this isn't published data, um, but, you know, it is obviously very helpful. So what you can see here is, the peak tree pollen count has increased over 35% um, since the 1980s, which is a, a big deal. And then of course, um, they've also looked at, you know, when, when is this pollen count um, coming in? And so rising temperatures are also affecting the timing of our allergy season. So, you know, as spring arrives earlier, your, your pollen season has started earlier. And so, of course, looking at this, you know, our peak tree pollen counts in Virginia are occurring about a week earlier. And keep in mind, this data is unpublished, but, you know, we are keeping track of this. Um, and this is actually, you know, also very important. Um, there was a, a recent survey that was done where they asked um, specialists in both allergy and immunology um, and um, in pulmonary critical care because um, these allergens also affect asthma. And two thirds of the physicians said that, you know, the, the um, issue with climate change and its effect on allergies are, are certainly um, becoming more of an issue. Um, with, with our patients. So what can you do for your patients um, during the allergy season? So um, there are some, some recommendations that you can make. So first, um, very simple, uh, keeping your windows closed as much as possible because you don't want pollen um, drifting into your home. Keeping your car windows closed when, when traveling. 
Um, and then also thinking about the best time of day to be outdoors when, when pollen levels um, are lower. Uh, unfortunately, this is really more so on rainy, cloudy, and, and windless days. Uh, but, you know, again, for, for someone who has severe allergies, their, their quality of life can really be affected by that. So we try to take that into account. And then, of course, you know, when patients are gardening, um, I always tell them, you know, try not to touch your eyes and, and face. Um, I have a lot of patients who actually do wear goggles to, to protect their eyes as well. And then a big one is um, having people, as soon as they come in, taking off your clothes and taking a shower um, after you've spent time outside because that pollen can collect on your hair and skin. And the reason why I also really recommend doing this as soon as they come inside is, you know, when you're kind of sitting in all of that, you also end up spreading that pollen to other parts of your house. Um, and especially for patients who maybe just take off their clothes and then change into another pair for sleep and go to sleep. Um, the thing is, is that you're actually breathing in all of that. You do, and so then a lot of patients will say in the mornings, I, I feel like my symptoms are so much worse. And um, that can be part of that because again, you're just length lengthening that exposure time. And um, one, one website that you can actually uh, direct your patients to um, is actually um, this website here. The National Allergy Bureau actually um, puts out there what the pollen levels are, which can be really helpful for patients because then they also can get a better sense of, you know, is this really a good day for me to go outside or should I maybe try to limit my outdoor exposure and, and things like that. So. Um, again, you know, a great resource. Um, so that's really it from my end. So um, I think that uh, John um, was going to step in and give you guys some recommendations for what you all can do for advocacy. So John, I'll turn it over to you. Absolutely. Thanks, Christine. That was uh, really informative and helpful overview. Just a reminder to everybody to um, feel free to submit questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your webinar window. Um, if you have any questions, um, Christine will be glad to take those and respond to them, or, or Sam, if you have more or broader questions about BCCA and our work. Um, but I, we, we wanted to reserve a, a moment just to provide everybody a, a quick advocacy opportunity on each of these webinars in the series. Um, it is always important for us to um, use our positions um, as credible messengers um, to speak out um, uh, and, and try to influence policymakers and the general public uh, about the dangers posed by climate change. And right now there is an opportunity, a unique opportunity um, presented by the uh, EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, just a week or two ago, finally issued a supplemental rule called Strengthening Transparency in Regulatory Science, which could not be more misleading um, in, uh, in many, many in our uh, advocacy circles and our partner organizations refer to it as the censoring science proposal, because it would essentially restrict the use of uh, scientific studies that are based on health data um, that, that relies on confidential health data from patients um, as it pertains to setting air pollution regulations and, and many others. Um, many of these, many regulations that have been based on these types of studies have stood for decades, like the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act. Um, uh, they have stood the test of time and are now under threat because of these regulatory rollbacks. Um, it would also allow coal companies and, and others, um, uh, other fossil fuel companies to question the science behind the regulations that are issued on their industries, um, opening up uh, uh, legal challenges, potentially on, on past um, regulations that were set, but certainly on future ones and limiting um, the studies that can be considered um, in order to set stronger regulations moving forward. So we wanted to encourage everybody on this call listening in to um, spread the word about this um, to your networks. You can look up that strengthening transparency and regulatory science rule. There have been 
um, many articles written about it um, uh, as, uh, while the media has been consumed by um, the response on COVID. But there are two easy actions that you can take just in the next couple of weeks. The public comment period deadline is April 17th. Um, to submit a public comment to the EPA. There's a simple action for health professionals specifically to take um, that the American Lung Association is hosting, and that's at lung.org slash save science. If you scroll down on that page, there is um, a, a simple letter action that you can take that'll go to the EPA um, discouraging this, this rule from going into effect. Um, the other action opportunity is that in light of uh, a public hearing, which the EPA usually hosts around rule changes of this nature, um, that it's obviously not uh, possible in this current period, um, the Union of Concerned Scientists, a great organization, is hosting a virtual public hearing. Um, I don't know if you all are able to access the links from the webinar, but we are certainly happy to distribute those um, after the fact. They're hosting a virtual public hearing on April 14th to collect public comments, which they too will deliver to the EPA. So we encourage you to take a moment um, and, and take advantage of those action opportunities on this important issue. And with that, we'll turn it back open. I don't see any questions um, submitted. Um, so, uh, Sam, is there anything else you want to say, or Christine, to wrap up? Folks are, are still welcome to submit questions, and we'll be happy to answer them if any come in. But I'll let you all wrap it up, if not. I would do have a question that just came in, Christine. Um, right, so uh, first question here. So are you hearing from your patients who are curious about the link between climate change and health? Um, and yes, uh, very much so. So um, interestingly enough, this is actually um, a question that comes up quite a bit because I think a lot of our patients are trying to understand, you know, why are my symptoms so much worse now than they were a few years ago? Um, and, you know, I, I do bring this up a lot um, in my discussions, and this is something that um, I think other physicians can do as well, because I think not only does it raise awareness um, about climate change, but also it, it provides a direct, more direct links to, to them um, because they can see that themselves. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing is just wondering, you know, why, um, you know, why is this happening? So. And then a follow-up question here is, um, if a patient comes to you about that question and asks what they can do, um, what can we suggest to them um, as, as private citizens? Um, so, you know, really when I've, I've asked them about, you know, when they've asked me about that, um, I have, you know, tried to direct them to, um, you know, their, their, local organizations or national organizations that that focus on climate change um, our own um, allergy organizations like the um, quad ai um, does a lot of advocacy work um, where uh, not only do they ask physicians to participate but they do ask um, uh, they do ask uh, patients to participate as well so um, they can look on these different websites to find resources for, for that. So, um, and then I just had another question come in that said, could you speak to any unique vulnerabilities that children are facing in the context of asthma and allergies? Um, so I think the biggest issue here is that, you know, when you, when you do develop allergies, you are at um, an increased risk of developing asthma. And so, I think that for for children, um, you know, because we're seeing um, an increase in those rates um, over time, you may also see the development of asthma. Um, the other thing is the fact that if they already have those diagnoses um, at the same time, then we do get concerned about um, flare-ups of their asthma. And so, what we are finding is. Um, 
you know, with these allergy seasons, at least um, in our clinics, we are seeing an, a rise in the number of asthma exacerbations and, and how do we um, really address that? So there is um, that vulnerability and especially with children, the other issue that, that comes up, you know, generally you manage asthma with um, inhalers, um, but the problem is that you know, oftentimes, depending on how young they are, it can be difficult um, for them to use that. So you're trying to adjust um, their medication using nebulizer. So I think that, that combination of factors, um, not only in terms of, you know, how often they're getting sick, but then how do you manage that when they do become sick um, becomes an issue. So any other questions at this point? Dr. James, this is Samantha. Dude, I have one question. Um, have you noted any um, increase in the amount of medication um, children are needing? I, I know in my practice, uh, it's not unusual now for me to have to treat some of my patients with multiple medicines to control their allergies, sometimes three or even four if they're on an oral antihistamine and a nas a nasal steroid sometimes also an eye drop, and then also an allergy, uh, also a, a con al asthma controller, uh, inhaled corticosteroids. So sometimes I'll have kids on four medicines, and uh, that does seem like an awful lot uh, to need to control a child's allergies. And I was wondering if, if you're aware of uh, an increasing difficulty in managing people's allergies. Um, yes, I mean, that is definitely uh, the case. Um, I don't have any great studies that are, um, you know, that answer that question. I, but I, I think anecdotally, um, that is what we are facing. And of course, um, one of the biggest concerns that, you know, parents face um, is in terms of, you know, the amount of steroid and, and how that um, will affect their children. And so there's this... Um, you know, there's a bit of a balancing act here. And I, I do think it would be great if we could actually um, get that information in a more systematic way um, so we can look at that. But just anecdotally, I, you know, I, I do find that during their um, spring allergy season or during a bad allergy season, we step up therapy by adding um, different combinations of inhalers. Um, and then in terms of nasal sprays, you know, um, when taking, you know, Flonase, something like Flonase or, or using um, something like Zyrtec in combination when that's not really enough, you know, we end up adding an antihistamine nasal spray to that. So, um, and, and that can be very overwhelming for, for parents, for children, and really for anyone who's dealing with all of this. So I, I definitely agree with you. Um, we just had another question here. What about people who don't have air conditioning and leave windows open to get fresh air, are there other suggestions to help? Um, you know, that's really, that's a great question. Um, and I think that uh, we, we often find, um, you know, it, it's really kind of a risk benefit kind of thing. Um, you know, what I'll tell patients to do is if you can, um, you can uh, try to rinse your eyes in the morning and in the evening to try to get some of that pollen out. Use your allergy eye drops in the morning and in the evening. Um, but you know, I'm I, again. I think that, um, or we we try to say if you are going to open your windows, try to limit the amount that you open the window. Just so again, you're just trying to um, limit the amount of pollen that's actually getting into the house, but um, those aren't the, I understand those aren't the strongest suggestions, but those are really what we have at, at this point, basically. Anything else? I think we got one more question. Up. Oh, sorry, I did not see that, I apologize. Um, any recommendations for indoor versus outdoor allergy triggers in respect to children's environmental health and opening windows to get ventilation. So, so I guess um, what I'm gonna 
I'm assuming that this is more in terms of, you know, what to do with dust mite, things like that. So, um, so again, you know, oftentimes what we recommend for things like um, dust mite, you know, your indoor allergies, what we'll recommend is, you know, try to do things like getting your um, dust mite covers for your bed. Um, you know, the, a lot of people also ask about HEPA filters um, and how helpful those are. Um, the studies in terms of HEPA filters have been um, at best equivocal because you have some studies that show, yes, they do reduce levels of these allergens in your home, but the issue that comes up is, um, you know, how much of an effect does it have on clinical symptoms? Um, Unfortunately, again, we, we don't really have um, strong data that shows uh, one way or the other. Um, we generally will tell patients, you know, you can try using that and, and see if it helps. But, you know, as you guys are probably well aware, HEPA filters are not exactly um, inexpensive. So I, I will say anecdotally, I have some patients who say they find them very helpful um, versus um, other patients who will say, I don't know that it really made much of a difference. So, um, so yeah. Um, and then another, um, another attendee actually just um, made a suggestion where they said um, they actually, if they have to open their windows, I use cheap furnace filters behind a box um, fan. If you have a window that's standard size, you can place the filter in first. Um, and then the box fan in front and close the window down. Um, it will not stop all the pollen, but it can help. Um, so yes, you can certainly try that. Again, um, depending on how severe um, your allergies are, that also makes a difference because people's sensitization um, also plays a role in this. Unfortunately, I, you know, none of us can necessarily predict um, you know, how bad are your allergies gonna get, but again, these are all simple ways to try to see if they can can help with that. For patients who are having um, severe symptoms, of course, we'll always discuss allergy shots, um, but that's more of a long-term goal or a long-term plan that, that does not have um, an immediate effect, unfortunately. Um, and then we have another question here. So one or two case examples linking human health outcomes to environmental episode, uh, to environmental episodes would be um, illustrative. Um, Leon, do you mind? Um, I guess if you could um, provide more of an example of what you mean by that. Um, are you able to type that in? Christine, you could yeah. also go to the attendee list and unmute Leon if he wants to clarify. Oh, that. okay, got it. Here, give me one second. I believe I did that. Correctly. How's that? Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hi. We can. Hi. We can. Um, uh, Dr. Vinci here in Southwest Virginia, Roanoke. Mm -hmm. um, just, you know, didn't know if you had any case examples where uh, or you or anecdotal where you are aware that uh, when uh, an environmental uh, episode occurred, maybe, you know, a, a real high allergy day or pollen day, whatever, uh, sadly, a, you know, a, a human consequence that might have been a child needing, a, needing a emergency treatment or something along those lines. Oh, sure. I mean, I think that this actually um, happens pretty frequently in our office where, um, I mean, this is why we have our, our, our sick visits largely during our um, allergy season in the spring season is because we have patients coming in and um, their asthma has acutely flared up. And so, um, and when we, not that we're actually checking the pollen counts on a daily basis um, or anything like that, but if you, I've just looked back on certain days just to see, you know, um, what were pollen counts uh, like. And so, you know, again, you can see that, okay, tree pollen is particularly high on this day. Well, look at that. I actually had four acute visits that came in where I ended up having to give a nebulizer treatment in the office um, 
or you know something along those lines. So um, that is definitely the case. Um, unfortunately, what I was going to say is to to be quite honest, I I feel like. Um, in, in our office, we, we see that so frequently, we see such an increase in the number of patients who are coming in just even outside of their annual visits. Um, and I think asthma becomes a big issue. And then of course, um, the concern about whether or not is this, you know, an allergy attack or is this, you know, a sinus infection that's been just worsening and worsening and, you know, what do I do about that? So I hope well, that answers you. your question. Thank you. Again, uh, you know, uh, that kind of, um, uh, those stories are so powerful when we're talking to policymakers on the Hill or in the state capitol or wherever, to, you know, to drive the message home. Um, it, it really helps uh, to have, have that at our fingertips. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Anyone you know, else? Christina, this is Samantha. One thing that I would, um, you've probably seen as well is that for my for my child child patients who have uh, allergy induced asthma, many of them have uh, or teenagers have for years started their controller medicines um, at a given time, say often in in March. And what I'm finding now is that uh, they're they're needing to start their controlling medications earlier to prevent. Uh, an asthma attack because the allergy season is starting earlier. So I'm finding it uh, more ch challenging to know when to start children on controlling, on preventative medication, just because it's becoming harder to predict when the peak pollen season will, will start. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. had that experience as well. Um, yeah, no, that's, um, that's definitely the case because we used to be able to say, oh, just, you know, start in early March, and then you should be good to go. But, um, and I think what I'm also facing is um, patients who normally didn't even require a maintenance inhaler at all, um, suddenly are finding I'm using my albuterol way too frequently. Um, what I'm actually telling my patients now, um, because I'm noticing that their symptoms are coming on earlier and earlier, um, is once you start noticing that your breathing is, you know, it's just becoming um, more challenging for you. Um, regardless of before, when you were told to start at this specific time, you start your maintenance inhaler now and do it consistently. Because again, um, we're just having much more trouble figuring out when is pollen um, coming in, when is it getting worse. Um, and another aspect that I just want to point out to everyone is, you know, when I gave you the season um, for each kind of pollen, the other issue that we're facing is that these pollens are now overlapping <laughs> much more. And so for someone who has, um, you know, tree allergy or grass allergy, and they think that, well, it's supposed to end at this certain time. Again, those, um, those pollens are, you know, lengthening. And then for people who have more than one type of pollen allergy, it's just um, become an even bigger issue. So, um, so they're finding that they're using their medications um, for much longer periods as, as well. So, um, Thank you for pointing that out, Sam, because uh, yes, we're, we're certainly facing that in our offices as well. Excellent. Well, thanks so much, um, Christine. This has been a fantastic presentation and a great way for us to uh, kick off this webinar series that we're looking forward to continuing in the coming months as a way to provide connection opportunities and uh, education to uh, members of Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action and, um, and those beyond Virginia's borders as well. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, please, as I said, feel free to email info at virginiaclinicians.org or visit our website, virginiaclinicians.org for more information or for follow-up links um, on these resources. And we will look forward to staying in touch and letting you know about the next webinar when we have it planned for May.
Thank Thanks you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. And um, also, if you if you guys do have any other questions, please feel free to email me, and I will try to get you that information. So, thank you so much, Dr. James. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good day to two. I appreciate it.